FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today is February 12th. 2020. Well, month is rapidly passing by us here. It's been pretty amazing. The markets have continued to go up. They took a little hit earlier in the month and then like, uh, you know, like spring follows winter. They're back at it again. New highs. And well, how long can it go on? We saw Tesla get close to a thousand cracked. Now it's still in the mid 700s. I think it's ready for another run. What do you think? Where do you think Tesla's heading? Email us, kl at kerrylutz.com with your opinion. So without further ado, Danielle Park is back with us now. She's uh, vacationing in warmer climes and very happy about it too. Danielle, hey, welcome back. It's been a while. So, So what about that Tesla, huh? Oh, yeah, Tesla. Well, you know, it's a great car. I've said that many times, but the price that you pay for a share uh, is a completely different story relative to the technology or the company itself. We see that time and time again, whether it's Apple or Amazon or Tesla or pot stocks or anything that, uh, you know, seems like a big growth area. Um, The price you pay still has a lot to say about whether it's speculative grade or whether it's an actual investment. And it's important that people don't confuse one with the other because, you know, Tesla at a recent high was trading at 200 times hoped for earnings um, that those have yet to materialize. Um, I have no, I have no doubt that they are the leader in electric technology, that they have an incredible uh, potential in, in the uh, EV, in the uh, battery infrastructure that they're building out in the, in the Tesla loop, as we've discussed in the past, in the, in the boring company, all the great things they're leading, but that doesn't mean that their price uh, per share is any way rational uh, in terms of the actual cash flow. So, you know, your, your, your present price is supposed to be a discount of the future cash flows. And when you're paying that amount for hoped for cash flows, you're really in the zone of, you know, just betting at the casino, really. And that's what people have been doing all over the world, of course, not just in Tesla, but that's been in, in you know, the epidemic before the coronavirus has been the speculative virus that swept the world. And um, we're seeing that. Um, you know, everything's been infected by the same thing to varying degrees. And that's why it's so difficult, I think, for people, because, again, they're always looking for something. They want an investment idea. They want a buy idea. They want something that's going to make them money. And they have a hard time appreciating that in certain climates, everything is sort of overvalued. And yes, there's good opportunities coming, but you have to wait for the right price. Yeah, that is for sure. But yet, You know, Daniel, we've been talking about this for years. They managed to keep it going and keep it going. There's got to be some limitation to what the central banks can do here in terms of perpetuating the bull market. I mean, they seem hell bent on doing it. Every uh, central bank in the world. I mean, it hasn't really worked in China too well, but the U.S. stock market, they keep it chugging along. So, you know, Japan is the poster child, as I've said many times, for this whole quantitative easing, constant injections of liquidity from central banks. They've been doing it now for 35 years. And although you definitely have recovery spurts, um, the reality is that, you know, Tokyo prices have fallen for 35 years. And, um, you know, the equity market is 40 percent lower than it was in 89. So even though they've managed to stimulate some you know, waves and cycles within that period, it is a fleeting. They're actually back in recession now. As you know, they've had many recessions since 2008. So it just shows you uh, what happens when you keep resorting to this same old gimmick to try and stimulate. And so, you know, you ask about Tesla um, in the parabolic rise since October, what has that coincided with perfectly, Carrie, as you well know, mm-hmm. it's these injections of liquidity from the central bank, the mm-hmm. not QE, QE that they've been doing in the repo market and the overnight market. Um, and of course, it's heavily subscribed, oversubscribed. So there's definitely 
this theme of crash of crunch and uh, of uh, distrust between the intermediaries, similar theme to what we saw in 2007. And they keep trying to sort of paper that over by pumping in more cash. And what that does is it reinvigorates animal spirits. It sparks rallies in assets that were already ridiculously valued, but it doesn't do anything to improve uh, household income. Uh, actual net worth in terms of the masses, um, in terms of uh, productivity growth, in terms of money multiplier through the economy, all the things that actually matter about how do we get more dollars into the pockets of more people to help uh, either by sa- increasing their savings to, to support the financial resilience and, and investment, capital investment in the economy. Um, how do we get you know that how do we get people out of debt so that they are they have more excess income per month to use for other everything else? Uh, those are the challenges that are facing us, and it's the same issues all over. I don't know if you caught, for example, that Southern Ireland had a election uh, in the last couple of days, and Sinn Fein, this this yes. party that was traditionally associated with IRA, yeah, IRA, right? So in the quote troubles in the seventies, when I actually lived there as a child. Um, you know, they were they were considered the terrorist wing. And as time has gone on, they've become more so mainstream that they, in fact, got a, a third of the vote in the election. So what are the themes there? The themes are the same as they are in Canada, the same as they are in most parts of America and all over. And they are all, uh, as I say, they've all been products of the same asset inflationary policy all over, which has left working people completely out of it. So you've got unaffordable housing. These are what the Irish defined as their most pivotal at the exit polls. Their most pivotal uh, issues in this election were unaffordable housing, uh, ramping insurance costs, flat household incomes, debt, uh, hospital waiting times, and homelessness. These are the issues that are defining um, what people are voting for today. And if they see a, you know, a, a, pol- a party that perhaps seems at the extreme, the point is that the, the, the left and the right parties, the typical two party systems have become so uh, about the status quo and so really supportive of corporatocracy and the and the positions that aren't helping the masses that everyone's looking for some other way to get around this or to, to force change in the system. So you've got, you know, those themes, I mean, Canada is just rampant with that right now because we have, you know, now we are seeing a big increase in rental properties. Uh, because why? Because the average uh, household can't afford housing anymore in, in, in many of the big centers in Canada. And, you know, that's the, the millennials, the Gen Xers, those people coming behind the boomers are struggling just to rent, never mind own. Um, so that gap is why, you know, when you say, well, how long can they keep this this sort of Ponzi-like scheme going with central bank injections? Uh, of course, the answer is I don't know. But my point would be that it makes us all so vulnerable to shocks. So whether that be in the form of a virus outbreak, which I think, by the way, is much wider and broader than is being reported so far. There was an excellent article in the Wall Street Journal uh, today just saying, that relative to the overconfidence, which is so dominant now in Wall Street after a 10 and you know 10 year expansion in asset prices, the medical community is not nearly as confident about containment on the issue of the virus. Now, I'm not saying it has to be the pandemic that ends the world, but the reality is that it's gre- greatly crippling the Asian economy and many other parts of the world, Australia, Canada, our you know, Minister of Finance warned today that it's going to be a major negative for the Canadian economy, thanks to lower oil demand. You know, we have a big contingent of Chinese uh, tourism. Every country has had in the last decade. uh, And they're great spenders when they go on holiday. So there's so many aspects here, knockoff effects. So on the one hand, you've got a lot of doubt and uncertainty around things like that and about the shifting political forces in the world. And on the other hand, you have this mass overconfidence in asset values. And I think those two um, are destined to meet somewhere in the middle. You know, boomers need to offload assets because they don't have enough cash and income. And the price that they want to offload those assets at is nowhere near the price that the people behind them can afford to pay. And that's why I'm confident that in the middle, the two must meet. You know, mean reversion means 
incomes have to go higher over time and asset prices have to come back down where people can afford to actually buy them. Yeah, well, you know, you're kind of striking at the heart here of modern monetary theory, Danielle, which says basically you can always get what you want, you know, in a little play on the Rolling Stones song. Um, you know, you can always get what you want. You just need to print up some more money to get it and uh, multiply that on a mass scale, billions of people all over the planet. Logically, this thing cannot work, Danielle. It has to blow up. It can't well, just it, go on. An excellent, I think, point on that very topic is today you have a Republican government in America and you have an economic expansion that has been 10 years in the running into the 11th year and you're running a trillion dollar deficit. I mean, this is the kind of ludicrous mode. Um, trillion dollar deficits are, first of all, unprecedented, but second of all, you'd think that you would have built a fiscal position of strength during this expansion. Most countries have not, though. They have done the same thing. They have ramped up spending. They have ramped up debt. They have said yes to all the status quo causes, and that they cut everything that really is you know, around what would actually help households to not borrow and spend more, but actually build up by lowering their costs, making housing more affordable, figuring out ways to get them uh, energy much cheaper, transportation much cheaper, healthcare much cheaper, how to build health in the first place so people don't need as many drugs, for example, as you and I've talked about before. Oh, yeah. Those are actually how you're going to fix this issue. Um, it's, you know, multifamily dwellings is going to be part of it. Um, generations living together, uh, building rental properties instead of all these, quote, investment houses, which everyone's overbuilt in the credit boom. Um, and, and, you know, that'll be better for balance sheets on households, but it won't be as good for in terms of economic growth. Because the multiplier effect of building a, um, a rental building or an apartment or multi -dwell multifamily dwellings uh, is better for households to be more efficient, share costs, spend less and save more. But it's not as good for economic growth in, in terms of GDP. So the way that we measure what economic progress looks like and what wealth and prosperity looks like, these concepts are all up for shift. And certainly the idea that we can pay for everything always while cutting everyone's taxes yeah. is just not feasible. Yeah, well, we've never, when you can run unlimited deficits, then there's no incentive to prioritize spending. There's no incentives to keep things in balance, you don't need to, to see that your tax collections equal your expenditures, all these little things. And it gives the politicians a free hand to really uh, bribe the voters uh, to help ensure their reelection. So some, some type of back to basics movement of what is the function of government? Should government be the guarantor or the uh, financier of the entire nation's college population, which is what the United States has become. It hasn't really accomplished the goal of broadening education. All it's done is, uh, is boost the salaries of professors, uh, educators, administrative staff. It greatly expanded them. And uh, it's been a boom for the construction industry because they're building new college uh, buildings all over the place. Every time you go to a college anywhere in the country, just about, that's doing well, that has a good uh, population of students, they're building uh, massive multi-million dollar structures and new labs and everything else. But the actual classroom time has actually declined over the past 20 years because these professors are encouraged to publish their research for the betterment of humanity. So they don't even care about their time in the classroom. What they're all about is, hey, you got a teaching assistant send it to him. They even have it down to the point where they can send their uh, exams that the students have uh, completed and they outsource the grading to some guy in India who uh, grades the exam. So like the uh, college professors become a manager of sorts, managing his research, managing somebody to teach the class and then managing somebody else to grade it. It's a little absurd and it isn't happening all over, but it's happening enough so that you got to think this is a little bit crazy. So the educational had a guest on recently fueled by easy money from the government, just like every other bubble. We've got 
trillion dollars worth of student loan debt in the United States now, non-dischargeable in bankruptcy. We've got the automobile boom. Well, that looks like it's petering out. The only company increasing their unit sales is Tesla. And you can argue that's because it's a specialty product, at least at this point, that is in the process of going mainstream. And every bubble we have, health health bubble, we got Medicare, like uh, running out of money, Social Security, all these things, government, the one common element there, and real estate booming prices as well. The one common element is government dominance in some aspect, usually the financing of that sector. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Lumina Gold, ticker symbol, LUM on the Toronto Venture and LMGDF on the OTC is yet another of legendary mining investor Ross Beatty's Lumina Group. It's advancing the largest primary gold deposit in Ecuador. The resource is estimated to contain 16.7 million ounces of gold and 2.2 billion pounds of copper. At just $7 US per ounce gold equivalent, it trades at an incredible 13% of its net present value. More good news is on the way with an updated PEA study expected in Q2 of 2020. It has unparalleled infrastructure. There's grid power to camp with plentiful, inexpensive hydropower available. It's close to two ports and is just eight kilometers from a paved highway. Water is plentiful. It's at low elevation and the closest community, which is very supportive of Lumina's effort, is just a seven kilometer ride. With all this going for it, it's likely to follow the typical Ross Beatty formula, which means big returns to shareholders. Find out more and sign up for notifications at luminagold.com. That's lumina, L-U-M-I-N-A, gold.com. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. That is true, but I would argue that the other extreme, the reason we have these very polarized positions is they're both a socialism of kind, which is corptocracy is a socialism for corporations. They've become so fat and dependent on government largesse um, and their their political cliques and assuming their their subsidies of so many different kinds are going to continue indefinitely. Um, and so in doing so, you know, they've sucked more and more and more of the cash flow away from everything else that a civil society requires. And so I agree with you that, that, that the entrenchment of these entitlements, whether they be for, you know, uh, whether they be for schools who have taken the, the the debt bubble as a constant flow of how to increase their you know expenses and and infrastructure every year, but at the end of the day, we do need education. I I think for sure that student debt is going to end up being wiped out or bailed out because it's a demographic issue. Um, the economy requires young people to get out of debt and on their feet. The boomers require young people to be able to take over the, the, the traces, so to speak, to pull the thing forward, to pay taxes, to cover social benefits, to, to you know, see them into their old age. Um, and so there are definitely areas where it makes every, every sense. We need to shift some of the subsidies that have gone to the largest corporations away from that and over to the uh, smaller, younger households that need to get started. And, you know, this is not new. This is a theme we've seen for centuries and centuries. Every time you get a society which is too highly polarized in an elite top that has an inordinate amount of the nation's wealth, uh, you know, you have to have this pendulum swing because you can't, it, it just goes to a point where it gets worse and worse and less and less sustainable and more unrest and it's just impossible to maintain it at some point. But, you know, back to... um growth areas. There's no question that there's some obvious growth areas that will ameliorate this situation. And certainly, as I've been saying, the way to get out of this is to uh, stop driving people further into debt and start helping them live for less um, and uh, cut out some of the financial intermediaries and costs, uh, cut out the cost of energy, reduce it greatly. Um, I, I saw an interesting survey. Toyota did a survey uh, recently, and they found that 52% of Canadians say they're likely to buy an electric vehicle within the next five years. Currently, there's 0.5% of 23 million passenger vehicles in Canada that are electric vehicles, just 0.5%. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and yet more than half of Canadians expect they're going to be buying one in the next five years. You know, GM has said they want 20 electric vehicles in production by 2023. Volkswagen wants 40. You know, so this is a theme that we're seeing in every country and every, in, all over the world. And yes, 50% of childhood uh, uh, um, asthma is, but has been linked to air pollution. So there's definitely a health case there just on air quality alone. But it's also just a function of how do we get transportation that doesn't cause so much harm to air and and cost so much to maintain and require so much subsidies to the producers? Um, and how do we get the masses moving around for less? And part of that is just tra- uh, transportation as a service, shared transportation, you know, convincing people, yes, you can walk and bike and take the bus. You don't have to go get yourself a nine-year car loan, uh, a lease. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just, it's, it's getting people to realize that doing that is actually longer term self-destructive for them. Uh, it doesn't actually help. It makes it worse. And for the economy too, you know, it gives you this, uh, this bang up front. But as we've seen, uh, auto sales are slumping all over the world along with manufacturing. Um, so these are trends I think are going to continue. And, and the, until we get to some substantive change in actually shifting, whether it's, you know, as I say, alleviating the debt burden on the masses so that they can start saving more and consuming um, in, in a more consistent way. Um, but that takes a resource shift. It takes a resource shift in, in asset valuations going back down. It, it takes a resource shift in subsidy expectations to certain sectors moving to others or reducing completely across the board because governments are already tapped out. So all of those things, I think, uh, are part of the puzzle pieces here that will fall into place. Um, And, you know, the virus just is an example of our vulnerability every day. You know, I saw an interesting study. I thought this was kind of cool. It was talking about how pitifully few women there are on boards all over in terms of big companies, how pitifully few CEOs are women, like 6% or less or CEOs of big fortune, let's say the largest 3000 companies in America. Um, and why does that matter? Well, it only matters to the extent that it's silly because you want to have uh, more sharing of income and um, more consumption or be people able to uh, get bring forward. You need to spread the income through the, uh, through both sexes more equitably. But secondly, um, because overconfidence is uh, a predicament that lets people think that they know with certainty what's coming and forget about the, the vulnerability that we all face. And it turns out that men have a greater pr- propensity to overconfidence. It's just part of, I think, the, the male hormones. I don't know. But it is, it, it is proven that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a common fallibility. And so women apparently are less likely to have this type of extreme overconfidence. Uh, in general. And so again, why is that good? Well, because we need to make more balanced assessments. We can't be terrified of, of moving forward or compounding the big challenges, but at the same time, we have to always be aware of all the uncertainty around us. And I think things like a virus outbreak just really underline that in the middle of an earnings recession PS that we've already had ongoing now for quite a while. And so you get a drop in revenue and trade in the world And you realize that you have a lot less cash flow going to service all these debts that companies have taken on and all these entitlements that people are hoping to to extract. Um, And you realize that this has really been badly managed for a couple of decades. And it's really got to change because it just can't continue. No, it can't. That's for sure. Hey, just a quick note that the uh, Boring Company project in Vegas hit a milestone. I believe they hit the end of the tunnel, which was something around... 3,600 feet. They did it way ahead of schedule. They're now boring out 20, uh, 20 meters, which is like 63 feet a day, which is a record. Um, I think they're lining that tunnel right now, uh, or at least pouring the foundation on the ground. I'm not sure exactly where it is, but they've actually turned around, Danielle, and they're started the tunnel because it's two tunnels. One from one end of the convention center and the other to the other end, they're parallel. They make three stops and they're supposed to be done in for CES. That's a consumer electronics show, which takes place like the first week of January every year. So it's supposed to be done next January, 2021 
for CES, and this is the demo project. You could look at it like we used to have World's Fairs where they would show all this futuristic technology. Now they kind of do it at these trade shows. And assuming that they're successful, because we don't know what type of vehicles they're going to be putting in that tunnel, uh, they've been close to the vest about it, whether they're going to be adapted Model Xs, maybe they'll put two of them together. So that they got to seat like 20, 30 people to be useful. So, or someone might be building it right now for all we know, based on Tesla technology. But this is a major milestone. Forget about what happens. The fact that they can drill these tunnels so quickly, that's the milestone. Whatever happens now, it may or may not be successful. I assume they'll get something running, even if they have to put Model S's in there or Model 3s, and they're all fully autonomous because they're just going down a mile long yep. tunnel so it's going to be successful it's going to happen but this really does represent a turning point yep. in our technology here and and you know if you i don't know about you but when i'm driving on freeways i'm always struck by what an archaic dangerous dirty messy <laughs> experience it is like if you think about why is transportation and energy so ripe for massive disruption because it's a very inefficient, messy, cumbersome, hugely expensive system that we currently have. A hundred years ago, it maybe seemed like it was efficient than what we're doing, but it's only able to continue in the last few decades because of the addition of debt. Debt everywhere. Debt for automotive, mm. automotive debt for developing the energy, the, the companies that issued it, all that, the subsidies from the government. And since we're at the end of the debt bubble where we can't continue to finance everything uh, because rates are so low, we've already hit the end of that. Incomes are stretched. You know, debt service ratios are already paralyzing. Oh, yeah. So now we have incentives all over to look at how we spend less and get more. And that's why that married with the technology, which people like Mr. Musk and others have helped lead, has really been this perfect marriage of the need, the critical need that's worldwide and the ability of the technology and new ideas to, to solve those problems. And that's why I'm very optimistic about this over the longer run. It's just, as I say, it's about spending less, not spending more. So the way that we measure economic growth, GDP, all that sort of stuff is likely to come up for revision here. Yeah, I think big changes ahead. I totally agree with you. I just think uh, when I'm on the highway, imagine if anthills were organized the way our highway system is. You know, the ants would have gone extinct millions of years ago. It's only because somehow they pass communication signals from the queen down. Not that we necessarily need that, but the organizational skills of the ant community are unparalleled. And then I think if the highway, if they were run like the highway system here, they would have like crashed into each other they would have gone extinct millions of years ago. So uh, basically, when you get too many cars, you know, a highway can only do X thousand cars per hour under human control. When you get too many cars, you have to have traffic. It's inescapable. They've filmed it the way it happens. Like some poor guy, like maybe a bird crashes into his windshield, hits his or her brakes, and then he picks up the speed again. But then behind him, like, it's havoc. The whole yeah. system has broken down. And I've seen that happen. Similar things to that happen where the traffic is going great. Some idiot puts on their brakes for no reason that you can discern, causes everybody to hit their brakes, chain reaction. So, yeah. I mean, when there was a few thousand cars on the road or a few couple of million people, you know, in the country, when, the, you know, the math of it worked. At a, at a lower level. But when you get to this scale, um, it, it yep. just doesn't make any sense anymore. Madness. Absolute madness. But you'll always find sanity when you turn into Daniel's site, jugglingdynamite.com. Might be too big a dose of fiscal sanity for many of you out there. But you always got to remember what goes up will eventually come down, although it might not go down as far as it started out, or it might even go down further, but it's going to come down. You can be sure of that. So make sure you go check out jugglingdynamite.com. Email us. What do you think? What do you think of the boring company's prospects? You think it's just a big 
Elon Musk hype that's going to go nowhere. Just remember that guy is launching missiles or rockets rather from from Florida here that were never dreamed possible just 10 years ago. They go, they lift the payload up, and then they return to Earth and can be rapidly turned around and reused again. That was the Rosetta Stone of rocketry. He did it, and it was all through this special welding that nobody even knew existed until he undertook the uh, the challenge. So, See, that's an exa- exact example. Sorry, just to, just to finish on that, I know, sure. but... There's an example of people saying, well, why would we want to reuse rockets? It's much more uh, financially advantageous to make ones you have to toss and remake because for GDP, that's a really smart thing. Then we have more sales. But he said, well, that model is really dumb because it's very inefficient. It's wasteful. And we need so many resources for so many things. We can't keep wasting money on things we toss. That same logic will define our, our go forward period in so many different categories. Couldn't agree with you more. And it was brilliant because, uh, you know, it cost X millions of dollars per pound to put stuff up in the air. And he made it a mere fraction of that. So when you're doubting Elon Musk, forget about the finances, forget about his hype. He loves to overpromise and deliver late. That's just the nature of a dreamer. I really don't think Tesla, the original Tesla, was much different than that. I'm not sure about Edison. He was more of a hard-boiled business person. But when when you look at uh, the guy and his dreams, he's not afraid to dream, and he's not afraid to try to achieve his dreams. And everybody should be like that in their own lives. Maybe you're not looking to send a person to Mars or Venus or Jupiter or whatever, but maybe your personal goal is just as unattainable to most people, they believe it's just as unattainable as Elon Musk's. And yet, when you work at it and unleash the uh, creative human uh, intellect that uh, so few of us use so rarely, there is no limit to what you can achieve. What will happen to Tesla Motors, I'm not going to predict, Danielle. I will predict that uh, that he set something off in many fronts, revolutions that can't be stopped at this point and will no doubt advance man. Anyway, email us, kl at kerrylutz.com, Twitter feed at Kerry Lutz, Facebook page is Financial Survival Network, and the website, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Danielle, we will catch up with you in a couple weeks. Thanks, Kerry. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.